Oh, so my name is Manaza Shah and I work um, as the administrator for the Quality, Diversity and Inclusion is Okay. Um, you want to introduce yep. yourself? So I'm Stephen Ned. I'm Joint Director of Workforce. I cover Rotherham Hospital and Barnsley Hospital, working across both sides. Perfect. So the reason as to why I wanted to have this initial conversation is because I wanted to put emphasis on Black History Month mm -hmm. and talk to yourself about your experience and what being black and yep. British means to you, yep. as well as what Black History Month means to you. So yep. starting off, we'll start off with the first question. Yep. What does Black History Month mean to you? So <coughs> I'm, I'm old, so I've been around a long time and Black History Month in this country is a relatively new concept. So it's been around for quite a long time in the States, and I think we've inherited it over here, which I think is a good thing. I think, to me, it's, it's an opportunity, we do it once a year, but actually we should, perhaps should do it more often, to reflect on the contribution black people have given to British society over a number of years. You know, people think about the Windrush generation, but it goes even further back than that mm -hmm. in terms of the contribution that... British, black British people are made, whether it's through arts, whether it's through science, whether it's through politics, religion. And it's an opportunity to stop and pause and reflect. And I think it's important because, rightly or wrongly, when I went to school, when we did history, when we did looking at the culture of this country, the very, very few black people were mentioned. So there was lots of white history as such, um, but very few mentions in the curriculum at schools about what, what black people have contributed to to this country and what, you know, whether that's through you know, world wars, et cetera, et cetera, very little historical, black historical figures. And therefore I think very few black historical role models. Yeah. So that's, I think that's, it, it gives people an opportunity to pause and reflect. I think I can agree with that. Even when I was studying history yeah. at school, there was more emphasis on World War One and World War Two. Yeah. There wasn't really much information about the consequences. Of, yeah. So let's say the, the Britain and what yeah. they don't know or the contributions of other people, yeah. um, of people of um, different, different groups. Um, so that's quite sad to hear because I'm, I'm a dinosaur, so I've been around quite a long time. So yeah. I started school in the early 70s and that's that was history, but it sounds as if it's not much changed. It hasn't, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah. So I went to school in the mid-2000s, um, to the late 2000s, and there was a lot more emphasis on the World Wars. Um, for Black History Month, there was the odd occasion where we, you would talk about um, contribution to um, uh, specific key um, people that helped within slavery in America, yeah. so such as um, Harriet Tubman. Yes. Um, but there wasn't really much emphasis on British figures and what they've done to help build Britain. Yeah, I, I don't think it has changed that much. So my eldest son is 22, mm. and he's, he's a 22-year-old, so he's quite engaged and active and angry <laughs> about lots of things. And last year, we I, I went with him on the... Um, there was a march in Sheffield after the killing of uh, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So it's about uh, Black Lives Matter. And it was interesting. All, he'd, he'd made a placard to go down there. I just went and accompanied him because it was an important thing to do. But he made a placard of, of protest, I guess, and all the names of the people that were on the placard were people from American history, from the civil rights movement, etc. Very few, if any, British figures that were that he knew or recognised. So he's, he knows a lot about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, etc. Very little about black British history. I think that's also because of the fact that it's never taught in schools. Yeah, yeah. It's all because they, there's so much focus on yeah. America rather than yeah. than Britain, really. Yeah. Uh, which is a shame because there are so many key figures yeah. um, that have shaped, and they, they, nobody's ever discussed Wingrush. In my, when yeah. I was studying, nobody, I didn't even know what Windrush was. Right. It was only when my granddad spoke of it from when yeah. he came here in the 50s and, and the contributions that they also made working yeah. within steel factories. And, and he spoke of the area that we live in, in, in Sheffield, uh, of where I've moved now, but we're in Sheffield, it was quite a diverse community. Whereabouts in Sheffield? Uh, so I lived towards Pittsmore. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of uh, friends that he had were, that were from the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, and how he spoke of, you know, the hardships that they all went through together. And again, it's never really discussed, which is, no. I think is a bit of a shame. Yeah. Because when, 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 when I was growing up, so as I say, I was born in 66, so would have started school in the early 70s. And I know you're thinking, oh, you don't look that old, but it's <laughs> true. Um, and society at that time was, so I was telling my kids about it, because they've thankfully grown up in a different world. I'm still not saying it's perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. Yeah. So when I was growing up, if you 
if you were looking to rent a house, there were regularly signs in the windows which said, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Oh, um, which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. It, which right? is, I mean, it's quite a phrase that's come into common understanding now because it yeah. was a reflection of the times, which is, you know, <laughs> black people, Irish people and dogs. Yeah. We don't want these sorts of people in our house. And that was effectively the society I started growing up in. Yeah. So when I first went to school, uh, we were the only black family in the school. Yeah. So it's very, you notice, I think being black in certain parts of society, you notice your difference. Yeah. So you, I often look, even now, in I I think by any measure, I've done all right. So I'm mm-hmm. director of workforce in the NHS, I've been around a long time. I think I'm reasonably well respected. Um, but actually I go into lots of senior meetings now and look around the room and very often I'm the only black face in the room. And that's reflected in the NHS. So if you look at the senior levels of, in the NHS, yeah. predominantly white men. Yeah. So there's an issue around gender equality, there's an issue around race equality. And I think it's getting better, but it's not getting better quick enough. But sometimes I think that it can be used in a negative way, that you're the, the poster child. Yeah. And I'm saying that from my own experience. Yeah. So when I worked for another company... Um, there was emphasis on, on progression yeah. and I was told oh you'll get far because you're Asian and you're a woman yeah. and you'll be the poster child and I don't want to go ahead because of the, the colour of my skin and yeah. I, I can imagine that you've had similar yeah. experiences where someone says to you oh yeah but you know you're different yeah. so you'll go ahead I want to get ahead because I'm any good at what I do Exactly. not yeah. because I tick a box or I fill a quota yeah. And so I, I've we've often had these conversations, particularly in HR, around positive discrimination. Yeah. So should we be encouraging, um, giving people of colour uh, or uh, different genders jobs because they are of that gender? I don't necessarily believe in that. Mm-hmm. I think you've got to be good enough at first. I think we've got to break down some other barriers around why people either aren't applying or if there's unconscious bias around shortlisting because the NHS is, as I said, at a senior level predominantly white, male, middle class, and it's a natural human tendency to recruit people who look, think like you. Yeah. So it becomes a kind of vicious circle of, I'm not nothing against old white men. Um, yeah. <laughs> my group of friends that I've known since school are all old white men. So mm-hmm. I've got nothing, absolutely nothing against them, but it doesn't reflect society, it doesn't reflect mm-hmm. capability, so that it's not a meritocracy, mm-hmm. it's just inbuilt, which... Keep saying it's getting better. I just wish it'd get better a bit quicker. Sooner, yeah. yeah. But I always say diverse means better ideas. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we've kind of covered this, but is there anything else that you want to cover in terms of what does being black or mixed race and British to you? So I when when I thought about that question, I I know that I'm black, which is a fairly obvious <laughs> statement <laughs> to make because I have a shave in the morning and I see that. Mm-hmm. But actually, I self, my self-identity came from my where I was growing up. So I grew up in a predominantly white working-class area of Sheffield. And all of my friends were, the vast majority of my friends were white. So you, I went to school, there were no other black people. Mm-hmm. So you make friends with people at school. I used humour as a defence mechanism because society at that time was far less um, tolerant than it is today. And when I say it's tolerant today, I think it's tolerant on the surface sometimes. Mm-hmm. But actually underneath, there's still people having those thoughts and feelings about mm-hmm. people who are different, whether that's black, whether it's women, whether it's LGBT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I grew up in a white world. And I, I tell people more now that I'm working class than I do identify as black because, A, I don't have to identify as black because I think it's fairly obvious. People don't see me as black necessarily because I'm in a professional job I can speak reasonably well so people don't assume you know people assume not just Steve is you know so I think I get away with not having to get past that color barrier more than perhaps I used to because society's changed but also I can string a sentence together I'm articulate I fit in that's not a conscious thing although I suspect it's a product of what I was telling you when I went to school when I went to school you Black people regularly got abused, mostly verbal. Um, my brother is a couple of years younger. His response to it was to fight fire with fire. Yeah. So he got into lots of scraps and et cetera, et cetera. And he was quite good at it. So yeah. he got protection from that through through that route. I used humour and I used fitting in as a as a tool. And as I say, still most of my friends now are from that white working class background. 
See, I had an opposite experience right. because the school that I went to, Fir Vale was very multicultural. Yeah. We had people that were Pakistani, Arab, Somali, black, and we all kind of fitted in because yeah. we were all so different. Now, because of that experience, I was kind of shielded from racism. Yes. And I didn't really think yeah. that we lived in, there were, that racism was still alive or present. It was only kind of when I got into the corporate world yeah. that I actually realised that, hang on, people don't see me as the same and that people do see me as different. And was that overt or was it covert? Um, a few times it was more so uh, microaggressions yeah. and um, quite passive. Um, I had a few negative um, experiences with customers, um, whereas I was referred to as the other coloured one or, um, or as a terrorist or um, a few experiences where yeah. customers didn't realise that I was in the room in the back of the office and I overheard yeah. um, horrible conversations. But I think for me, the downside was it was that I thought that my colleagues would support me and not continue to serve such a customer and, yeah. you know, tell them, like, if that was me on the other side, I would say, sorry, we don't, we don't take to yeah. that. I never got that support. Yeah. Um, and then a few times it was, um, when I worked for another company, it was to my face. Um, there's been times where I've overheard conversations and there's been times where it's been directly to my face. Um, and when I have taken it further, nothing kind of came of it. Yeah. Even when I spoke to HR about it. So for me, it, I just always thought, maybe I can't do anything. Is there any point complaining? Because I'm being told I'm complaining yeah. and I'm making an issue and I'm making other people feel uncomfortable yeah. um, based on the colour of my skin and how I feel. So, yeah. So I, I had a similar experience. So I tend not to get the direct racial yeah. abuse. I've had it in social settings, so at football matches, people yeah. uh, pointed out that I might be a different colour to them. Um, yeah. Not in a polite way, but... Um, so, so I've had that, but to be honest, it doesn't particularly bother me. Yeah. In a work setting, I was... When I worked in another NHS trust, um, so I was in this position, then there was a deputy director and then a director. And I was out of... It was a um, shared office. And I was out of that shared office for, for a while. I came back in. And someone told me that the director had been into the office. This was in the mid-90s and had told her an extremely offensive racist joke. And they thought, I should know about it, which was nice of them. And they told me what the joke was, which wasn't particularly mm -hmm. funny, but it contained a very offensive racial slur. Mm -hmm. um, and that was from the director of HR. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I got angry about it because I was younger and I was mm -hmm. <laughs> angrier and you get frustrated. And I spoke to my boss about it because she could see that I was angry. And she was really supportive and said, you know, if you want to do something about it, I'll support you. I'm really happy to do that. And whatever you want to do, have a think about it. But then it said, but you need to think about your career. Yeah. Because it was the director of HR who told the story, told the joke. And I could make a, an issue out of it. I could go up against the director of HR. But I was in his team. He was a fairly influential director within the NHS. And I, was, I, I didn't do anything. Yeah. And I look back now and I think... Now I would have the confidence, but that confidence comes from experience. Mm. It comes from a confidence that in my position, I think I've got a bit more confidence about power and authority and challenging that power. Then I was kind of, I was worried about my career. Yeah. And I thought, actually, nothing will get done anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's, that's the frustrating bit as well. But similarly, it kind of led me to the career that I am. Because yeah. I started off and went all the way up to being a wholesale manager and it just continued yeah. and I just thought to myself, I want to make a difference. Yeah. So I restarted my career because I thought maybe if I get into working within EDI yeah. that I could challenge it and make a difference without having to put it away and hide it just so that everyone else feels comfortable. Yeah. And I, I, I've been thinking about it quite a bit recently in terms of this concept of role models. So I've never viewed myself as a role model. I yeah. view myself as Steve, who I've worked hard, <laughs> I've done all right, and that's it. But actually, I realised, and I, I actually heard it during the Olympics recently in Tokyo, because there were people who were, whether it was disabled or whether it was black athletes, they, they were talking about the inspiration of role models. And the phrase that they used was, if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. And sort of back in my day when I was growing up, the role models for me were very, very limited in terms of, 
there wasn't there were only three television channels. There was no internet. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's no social media, so you got to see what you got to see on mm. BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And what you saw at the time I was growing up on BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV was television programs like Love Thy Neighbour, which had a very stereotypical view of black people. Yeah, it, 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 there's Alf Garner, who was a so-called comedian, who had very racist views. But I didn't see any black role models. Yeah. So I was thinking about it before we had this conversation growing up. Who, who were the black people that I looked up to? Mm. So exter- across the yeah, outside of this country, there's obviously Nelson Mandela. There's the civil rights leaders in... So, I've got a picture somewhere up on my wall of Rosa Parks, who I think is inspirational. Um, but in this country, very few. Mm-hmm. And I started to think about it. I said, who, 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 who were the black people in positions of authority when I was growing up? And very few, very few politicians, mm-hmm. very few actors, very few businessmen. I think I probably named Trevor MacDonald, who was a newsreader, and Lenny Henry, yeah. a comedian. I'm struggling after that. There were some sports people, but... I think now it's starting to improve. Yeah, it is, absolutely. It's a lot better now, um, and people are speaking out about it. Which yeah. is, um, so those two of the people that I, I think are quite inspirational are uh, um, Hassan Minaj or um, Akala. Yeah. They, they bring up these issues yeah. um, in a way that puts people on the spot. Yeah. Um, so I, I, tweet, I tweeted last year, um, probably around about the time I went with my son to the Black, Ma- Black Lives Matter campaign. I just put something about Black Lives Matter. And lo- loads of supportive stuff because the people who follow me tend to be kind of similar thinking, right-minded people, I would say. But a, a former governor from Sheffield Children's Hospital, where I used to work, um, replied with a, a reply which I saw, I saw quite often was, white lives matter too, Steve. And I got into a debate with him, not a debate because I'm not, I wasn't being antagonistic, but, mm. but my view is I know white lives matter, but at this moment in time in history, <laughs> black lives need a little bit more help. Yeah. So the, the analogy I use, which wasn't mine, I stole it from somewhere, but it sounds really good. I, I, I really care about Sherwood Forest. I'm really passionate about green trees, green spaces, etc. And I care about the rainforest. But I care a bit more about the rainforest at the minute because it needs a bit more help yeah. <laughs> because it's been deforested, etc., etc. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you can like two things at the same time but recognise one so. needs a bit more help yeah I um, agree it fell on deaf ears but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it does so yeah your experience within Britain how was that um I've <laughs> I part think because of the context I've talked to you about in terms of the seventies and the attitudes towards black people, gay people, etc., disabled people, wasn't enlightened, wasn't progressive. So I'm tempted to say, well, actually, it was a terrible experience growing up, but it wasn't. There were isolated incidents of what would now be considered probably a hate crime in terms of offensive language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, on the whole, because I'd surrounded myself with a good group of friends, um, had a close friendship group, we. They never bothered about the fact that I was different from them. I was yeah. just Steve. Uh, and we hung around together. We still hang around together. So I had a really okay period growing up. And because I think I was relatively popular in the sense that I, I could play football okay and I was a little bit funny now and again, I, people accepted me. Yeah. And I was reasonably, I said reasonably academic. I, I, would, I did okay, so I fitted in. Yeah. And I never felt as if I was... The differences were highlighted, but not to the extent that it had a significant impact on my growing up. Mm. I think about it more now than I did then. I think it's changed uh, completely. Um, I was speaking to my uncle and my dad about it. So they, um, in the 70s, when they went to school, they had um, a lot of skinheads that used to chase them. Um, yeah. My dad kind of got away with it a little bit because right. he, he was in a group that was fairly mixed. Yeah. So he kind of... Um, Blended in a little bit, yeah. whereas my uncle had one friend who was also Asian and sometimes struggled to integrate. Yeah. And a, a lot of the times, because of that, he he would be bullied or picked on by skinheads. Yeah. They would wait for him after school or chase yeah. him um, with whatever that they could find. Um, so he, he said to, to me, it was a conversation a few weeks ago, that he was quite fearful every single day wow. after school because he thought that he would act actually yeah. well beat up really um, so comparing my experience yeah. with him is completely different but yeah. like I said for me school was I was kind of um, it was a different environment it was yeah. but it was I didn't really 
I didn't really believe it. Well, not, not that I didn't believe in racism, but I just didn't think that it would ever have an impact on me because we were progressing so much. But like I said, it was only until I moved away from the area and surrounded myself in different situations that I realised that it was different. So another example is when I was applying for job roles. Uh, my name, Manaza Shaw, yeah. is clearly not an English name. Yeah. Um, same CV, one said Manaza Shaw on it, and the other said Emily Shaw. Right. Uh, Emily Shaw got the interview. Right. But Manaza Shaw didn't. Yeah. So I realised it's not actually me. It's not... Not the, the my qualifications. It's not your skills, your capabilities, yeah. or anything. It's, it's it's the name. Yeah. So that made me feel a bit low, and, yeah. and and I just thought to myself, is it ever going to change? And I had this conversation with my granddad, and bizarrely, and I found this really really odd. He said to me, "Oh, you just you just being a fairy about it. You, 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 the racism doesn't exist." I had an all right experience. But then I thought back and I thought maybe it's a language barrier thing. Maybe because they were physical and maybe they were using their words. Yeah. My granddad came from, well, what was it, Pakistan to, to this country in the 50s. And, you know, English wasn't his first language. Yeah. And he did pick up a, a, on it yeah. and working in steel factories and moving from city to city. But it wasn't brilliant. Um, so maybe he was missing every time that... There was a racist yeah. comment thrown at him, but I think I think language is important though. So um, language evolves over time. Yeah. So what was acceptable back in the seventies? If yeah. you said it now, some of the television programs that were shown in the seventies, you wouldn't yeah. they wouldn't get aired today. Yeah. And but language does change and evolve. So my wife's grandfather, nicest man you're ever likely to meet, and sadly passed away, but. He grew up, uh, fought in the Second World War, grew up in Sheffield, working class lad, and he, it wasn't a racist bone in his body. Referred to black people as coloured, yeah. which nowadays people, some people take offence because it's, it's not the right language. But I think sometimes that language stifles debate. Yeah. So sometimes I've talked to colleagues who are too afraid to say something because they're worried that they'll get the words wrong. Yeah. Whereas rather, I'd rather people just have a debate and say, well, actually, that word's a bit outdated because of X, Y, and Z, or this mm. is a preferred word now, but let's talk about it. Because if they're prepared to talk about it and the language and impact, etc., at least you're having that conversation. Whereas some people, are, I'm not going to say anything because I'm about to offend someone. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, and that could just remind me of the word half caste. So yeah. in the early 2000s, uh, my cousin, she is mixed race, and yeah. she, she described herself as half caste, and it was quite a normal word to yeah. use half caste. And um, my uncle recently used the word half caste and I said, you can't use that word. Yeah. And he was confused as to why. I was like, but why? I went, because you're, you're, not, you're saying that they're half an identity. You know, you kind of, um, it's seen as really, really bad. But when I was growing up, that was someone being polite. Yeah. Because there were lots more other words that could have been used. Some people now find mixed race not a, 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 an acceptable word. Some people prefer dual heritage. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose like I say, language, language does evolve. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, moving on to the next one. What made you join the healthcare industry? Um, I've answered this question many times before, usually in interview situations. Um, I want to say because I had a passion for healthcare and I love people and I wanted to make a difference. That's what I want to say. The real answer is I just left university desperate to find a job. The first one that I got offered was in the health service and I've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of fell into a career in, in HR because I'm, despite sometimes a bit of a grumpy exterior, I'm quite personable mm -hmm. and I get on with people. Mm -hmm. And actually I've grown into that, that first answer about it, it is a privilege to work in the health service in terms of seeing the difference and particularly the last 18 months yeah. in terms of what the NHS has, been, NHS has been through, what people at the front line have been through, what everybody in the organisation has been through. And it, it's quite humbling to see what we, the NHS, have done. And to actually feel quite a little part of that is, is quite humbling and quite satisfying. Yeah. So uh, when I talk to people who aren't working in the NHS about the job, I'm quite passionate about it. And yeah. the fact that it does make a real difference to people. I get quite angry sometimes with people who um, slag the NHS off because they don't think they understand the pressures that people are going through. Yeah, no, I agree. How about you? I think you mentioned it briefly. Yeah, so yeah. It was mainly because I wanted to make that difference. Yeah. Um, I applied for several roles within um, equality, diversity, yeah. inclusion, and I was struggling because I don't have a background yeah. within that role. And yeah. I realised that I had to start from the bottom yeah. and work my way up again. Um, I was involved in, in terms of when I worked 
uh, for various other companies I always worked um, with the BAME, BAME um, communities yeah. um, or groups um, and I was involved in a lot of fundraisers and, and tried to kind of get myself in that yeah. role sort of situation but it wasn't ever a permanent yeah. thing um, so it's something that I kind of wanted to, to focus on and I thought maybe if I apply for it within the NHS um, I mean, there was always situations or stories that you hear that, oh, the NHS is this, or it needs yeah. help, or, so I just thought, maybe if I can work my way in, yeah. I can hopefully try and make a difference. Are you pleased that you did? Yeah, no, Good. It, it's, it's a very rewarding career, yeah. um, because sometimes when you realise that you've not had that support yourself, yeah. and giving that, another person support, yeah. it, it, it's very satisfying yeah. and very rewarding, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I've, I've taken on the role. We're glad you did as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, one of the other questions I've got is, what struggles have you faced within the NHS? Well, m most of them, I think. So, very few overt struggles. So, my struggles have been the same as other people's struggles, whether they're white or whatever. So, it's about understanding the job, learning how to do the job better, progressing in your career. I've never been nakedly ambitious, so... I'm, genuinely surprised I found myself in a role as director of workforce. But I've just wanted to do a good job and being able to do a good job or being perceived to do a good job has kind of got me where I've got to. I'm not fair, other than, I've given you an example of where I've experienced, albeit second hand, overt racism before. I don't think I've experienced much overt racism before, but I think the thing that bothers me about it is the nagging feeling that it might be there, but I can't prove it. So I don't know what people's motivations are. Mm. And I don't like to ascribe a motivation because of they're treating me differently because I've been treated differently before. Mm -hmm. But it might be a genuine reason why I've been treated differently. But the, that kind of little voice at the back of your head saying, is it because I'm different? Mm -hmm. And there are, there are occasions where other people, other white colleagues have picked up on the fact that I've been treated theoretically different. And have asked me the question, do you think that's because you're black? Mm -hmm. And I've said, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. Because I genuinely don't know what people's motivations are unless they're overt and say, Steve, I'm not talking to you because you're black, then that's fairly a bit of a you know, giveaway. But actually, don't, people don't say that. People yeah. behave, and a lot of it is subconscious. Um, so it's very, very difficult to prove. Mm -hmm. So I don't... You could argue, I can't have suffered that much because I've got where I've got to. Yeah. Um, but th th there's a concept that I was introduced to relatively recently called weathering. I don't know if you've heard of it. I have heard of that, actually. Yeah. So it's... I'll get this wrong, but the, the the theory is, so if you, if you John will know this, who's off camera, but I'm pointing to him. <laughs> um, when you go running out on Kinder Scout or the moors or whatever, you'll see lots of rock formations, and those rock formations change over the years because of weather, whether it's the rain or ice or snow. And the concept is that I've changed and become different because of my experience. I'm, I'm sure it's the same for everyone else. And because I'm, I'm black and I'm different and have been treated differently. Lots of little things, which I kind of just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. eventually lots of little things take the toe a little bit and it starts to get a little bit tiring after a time. I'm not, I'm not, not down beat about it, but I've kind of recognised it later in life that these little things do add up and, and have an impact. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, the, I've only had a very short-lived experience here. Yeah. Um, the team that I work with are absolutely amazing. Yeah. The working within the hospital and any form of training that I have been on or helped with training, it's made me realise the importance of why we do what we do, especially with the EDI team. Yeah. Um, to give you an example, we went up on the wards to do 15-minute um, stop-the-shift training right. for race and religion. And sometimes I don't think people realise that the comments that they're making are not helpful and they yeah. can come across very ignorant. So I had, um, when I was um, helping with the training or explaining why we're doing what we're doing and, and what we can do to become more better, Yeah. Um, I had people, I don't understand what your problem would be, you're so light-skinned. <laughs> or I've had, um, I just think that people take racism too far in terms of making it an issue and skin, skin colour isn't an issue. And I've had also another comment of, why can't I use the word coloured? And it's trying to change that idea. Through education, yeah. yeah. But not forcing it so that yeah, people yeah. feel that it's kind of been shoved down their throat and, yeah. and, and, and taking a gentle approach to kind of make a change. Yeah. Um, 
equality, diversity, etc., kind of goes in waves in the NHS. So many years ago, it was a, I'll say, a fashionable thing to do. So every NHS trust responded because they, they were given an order from above to take it seriously, and they were told to appoint someone as a lead in the trust for it. So when I went to Sheffield Teaching Hospital, I was the lead. And I think I was the lead because I'm a person of colour, and they felt, oh, this is about people of colour, so you'll be good at this. Might not be. So I went on a training course down in London, and it was all the trusts, equality and diversity leads. And the vast majority of them were non-executive directors, quite a significant proportion from a BAME uh, background. But equally quite a few white people, which is which is fine. Um, and at lunchtime, we had to go across to this hotel to get lunch. And at the time, and I think it probably still is this case now, London hotels were often staff, staffed by people from overseas. So whether it's uh, people coming to work from overseas, etc., etc., and usually people from a black and minority ethnic background. So we were, going, we were on this diversity conference. Got across for lunch. I was sat talking to a colleague and needed to go to the toilet. Went up to get to the toilet. This chap, this white chap, stopped me. Who was on this diversity conference? Said, "Can you get me a spoon?" So he, he made the assumption mm-hmm. that because I'm of a certain colour. I must just work at the hotel. Yeah. So can I satisfy his needs to get him a spoon? I, I politely declined. Yeah, well, that, that must have been uncomfortable. Yeah. Face, face eventually. Yeah. 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 When he realised his face was a picture. Ah, I can imagine. <laughs> so, if you could go back in time to give your eighteen self, eighteen year old self, any yeah. advice, what would that be? Um, probably worry less. So I, I'm not a natural worrier, but a lot of the things I have worried about are things that haven't ha- actually happened. <laughs> so you, you think, oh, this could happen and that could happen. And 99% of the stuff that you worry about doesn't happen. So one of the things I, I, I discuss this with my wife quite a bit is you can only control what you can control. So once you kind of get your head around that concept, which I didn't at 18, it makes life a little bit easier. Because if I can't control it, I can't do anything about it. And if I can't do anything about it, why worry about it? Mm-hmm. Um, so just be a bit more easy on myself, I think, a little bit. It wasn't until that I realised that I wanted to make a difference and the way to do that is yeah. to change careers and, and make a difference. And, and that's how I see it, see it is channeling my anger or frustrations yeah. and rather than, you know, constantly getting into arguments yeah. um, and I've been in a Twitter war before where yeah. people have you know been ignorant and you can't get through you know a fire fire does not make sense. Yeah. and you've got to try and influence people haven't you exactly. and some people can't be influenced so kind of forget them yeah. but and they're that, not going to be influenced by anger either are they? exactly but that's not just in, in work that's in life in yeah, general yeah. You've, yeah. You, sometimes you've got to let go of pride and ego yeah. I suppose yeah. so yeah <laughs> So the final question I've got is, what do you do outside of work? So I touched on it a little bit. So I um, used to play a lot of football. Um, and I enjoy sports generally, but when you have children, that takes a bit of a back seat. So now they've grown up again, I'm back into sports. So play football once a week, go to the gym, unless I've got a bad back, which I've just had. So I'm back mm-hmm. now going back into the gym. And I do a lot of walking. So I started walking to get away from the stresses and strains of work and stuff. And just, so when you go, I used to do it on my own, go out, get up on, into the Peak District and just walk for miles. And, and it was great. And it still is. So I've, I do a lot of that now, although I do it mostly with friends. And I think I think there's a lot of things that we're doing within the Trust to, to kind of challenge that and, yeah. and, and help. And I, I hope that it does work. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, structures that have been put into place and support, which, which I'm quite, quite... Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Doing a great job. Thank you very much.